The war in Vietnam has fought with highly sophisticated weapons. What begins as a guerrilla conflict ends as a large-scale and vicious conventional war. More bomb tonnage is dropped in Vietnam than in World War II. The targets are military, but for both sides, the war is a test of civilian determination. American strategy is to pound North Vietnam into submission. North Vietnamese strategy is to wait it out. It becomes history's most intense display of firepower. America's overwhelming air power is at first used sparingly against North Vietnam. It begins in 1965. The policy is called limited bombing, staggered airstrikes to gauge communist response. Selecting the targets has taken an entire year of planning under President Johnson's guidance. A senior planner is Walt Rostow. He briefs the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, William Fulbright. Uh, Mr. Rostow. I remember had a theory, they call it surgical bombing. I heard him elaborate on this on various occasions. That is, you would give the North and East notice that we will bomb plant A tomorrow and take it out. Now, we don't want to hurt you. We don't want to kill any civilians. Everybody get away. We, this is what we're going to do. Uh, now, all you have to do is just have, go, to, go to a peace conference. Let's settle this matter. If you don't... Uh, after B and plant A, then plant B and plant B, we just give them notice. And he says, surely at some point, you know, they, they would quit because they see we'd utterly destroy the country. The theory relies on America's new catalog of high technology weapons. The F-105 Thunder Chief, the principal fighter plane. Its speed, 1,300 miles per hour. Three million missions are flown in history's longest, costliest air war. Navy carriers enable close-range missions. An around-the-clock all-weather bomber, the A-6 Intruder. It carries 30 500-pound bombs. The Intruder is designed to fly at slow speed for maximum accuracy. The supersonic F-4 Phantom, it is used to protect the bombers, patrolling ahead, striking at anti-aircraft positions. Over 40 types of attack planes are constantly over Vietnam. The B-52, the eight-engine bomber, is half as long as a football field. It flies at 30,000 feet, carrying 27 tons of bombs. An Air Force training officer explains the B-52's role in Vietnam. The use that we're making of the B-52 out here is as another tactical support weapon on the immediate battlefield. Uh, and in that capacity, I think it's been extremely effective. We find that the, the greatest effectiveness of the B-52 is this big payload. This is a very fine thing to be able to put on a target that has some impact upon your operation when you're a tactical commander. Uh, also, we like the fact that uh, it can be delivered around the clock, uh, regardless of weather, with the same general accuracy in all conditions. Uh, it can be delivered with a great deal of what we call shock effect upon the enemy, because there's really no signal that the attack is coming. Use of the air arsenal is personally supervised by President Johnson. There's a special weekly luncheon at the White House at which targets and weapons are approved. Secretary of State Dean Rusk. At those Tuesday luncheon sessions where we considered bombing targets in the North, 
There were times when we would require our flyers to go in through the more heavily populated areas to deliver their bombs on military targets, rather than easier targets because of the difference in the possible threat to civilian neighborhoods and civilian populations. The policymakers also rely on the air war to reduce American casualties in South Vietnam. The original bombing scenario calls for a communist peace overture within six months. But the communist response is to step up the war in the South. The U.S. in turn extends the area of bombing. Targets are in six main categories. One, power facilities. Two, war support facilities. Three, transportation lines. Bridges are the most important transportation targets. Four, military complexes. Five, fuel storage areas. Six, air defense installations. We hear an awful lot about surface-to-air missiles. They're called SAMs or referred to as SA-2s. This is a picture of an SA-2 site situated in the immediate Hanoi area. A close-up of this particular target would look something like this. Very clearly, you can observe the presence of SA-2 missiles. And in this area, we find the radar van, which controls the firing of the missiles, and also tracks the aircraft along with providing guidance to the SA-2 missile. The airstrikes fail to stop the war. Half a million American troops are sent to South Vietnam. In the ground war, rapid air support is heavily used. A sizable attack is reported. A prop engine Cessna acts as scout for the jets. It locates communist troop positions and relays these to the nearest air base. Air support reaches most combat areas within minutes. The spotter plane guides the fighter bombers to their target. It becomes automated air war against jungle infiltrators, bombing by coordinates, radar guided rockets. Napalm, which scorches a hundred foot radius in a single burst. Satellites scan the remote jungle trails. Computer technicians in Thailand and Guam identify targets for remote control bombing. Despite the technology, communist infiltration into South Vietnam steadily increases. In North Vietnam, special labor battalions repair the bomb damage. Hanoi claims just 20 supply trucks a day reaching the South will sustain the war. 1967. In Hanoi and Haiphong, 200 missile sites and 6,000 anti-aircraft guns make the cities almost immune to low-flying aircraft. The surface-to-air missiles are Soviet SA-2s called SAMs. Mounted on trailers, the SAMs are kept moving to avoid detection. North Vietnam also gets Soviet MiG-17 jet fighters and later the superior MiG-21s. Some MiG-21 units operate from safe bases inside China. The MiG-21s account for 90 downed American planes, but in aerial combat over North Vietnam, the U.S. claims a kill ratio of 2 to 1. The main American aerial combat weapon is the Sidewinder missile. Moving at two and a half times the speed of sound, it can hit a target up to six miles away.
it tracks an enemy plane by seeking heat from the exhaust. The Sidewinder is considered the most cost-effective missile in history. As the air war comes closer, Hanoi evacuates. All children and non-essential civilians are sent to the countryside, where almost everyone has relatives. Concrete potholes on every street provide a simple, inexpensive defense. With just a minute's warning, the streets empty as people scatter to these individual air raid shelters. The countryside adopts an even more unconventional defense. The southern infiltration routes are the most heavily bombed and the most vital to keep open. So entire villages go deep underground. Children are born and raised in tunnels. As the years pass, some tunnel communities extend for dozens of miles. While North Vietnam demands total commitment, America practices restraint says Secretary of State Dean Rusk. We did not want to um, expand the war into a war of total destruction. What we were trying to do was to keep the North Vietnamese from overrunning South Vietnam. Um, and uh, hopefully we were trying to bring about the kind of settlement that we achieved in Korea, that we achieved in, with the Berlin blockade, that we achieved with the Greek guerrillas. Uh, without that uh, massive all-out uh, course of destruction. And there was some point in, uh, in effect, leaving Ho Chi Minh there as a person with whom we might make peace, or at least make an armistice. So we didn't, re we didn't really go after the, uh, the city of Hanoi and the structure of the government of North Vietnam. Some American bombs are aimed at military targets in the populated suburbs of Hanoi. These communist films show civilian destruction. Most towns south of Hanoi are completely leveled in the period 1965-68. According to an official U.S. estimate, 52,000 civilians are killed. The North never discloses its casualties. Its 20 million people withstand 800,000 tons of bombs. The civilian population is mobilized in teams of thousands. Dikes, bridges, roads are rebuilt with little more than muscle. An air war designed to succeed within six months has already lasted six years. A U.S. Air Force film depicts a briefing of B-52 pilots. Open your bomb doors 30 seconds prior to release on your primary target, X-ray 26. After your release, break right to point Foxtrot and proceed to the alternate IP. For release on the alternate target, open your bomb doors 30 seconds prior to release on X-ray 30. Would you rise, please, for Chaplain Clarahan? Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, bless these crews Give to them the same peace and security that these men try to bring to the world today. Amen. The B-52 Stratofortress, originally built to deliver the atomic bomb, shapes the conduct of the Vietnam War. Its enormous cargo capacity is adapted to carry up to 100 bombs. Its main purpose is to destroy communist base areas. Okay, radios. Warning and indicator lights. Sixteen point zero seconds. Ready, ready, now. Coming up on a stick now. The legs. Getting my gear. Where is it? The B-52 flies six miles high, unseen, 
unheard. I understand. Zero it depends zero. on correct intelligence to locate a target. Otherwise, it is bombing blind. Three is coming out pretty good. Right. Even psychologically, air war is waged at a distance. The air crews are trained to be emotionally detached. One reason, the complex electronics demand all their attention. Also, the destructive force they control and unleash could emotionally overload them. I got the time going. Eight decimal five is what we want. Five, four, three, two, one. Stand by to release. Ready, ready, now. Bombs away. Pack time, ready, ready, now. A B-52 carries about 80 bombs. Each cuts like a scythe for a quarter of a mile. In Vietnam, the B-52s are only in danger when there are missile defenses. For the low-flying fighter bomber pilots, it is very different. More than half of those shot down are killed in the crashes. They must control fear. Although at times, uh, <laughs> you're, you're pretty scared when you have to roll in on something up there, especially when you look down and you see nothing but a black cloud or a white cloud down below you. It's, uh, it's about as, as scary a mission as I've ever been on. Uh, I think it tries you to just about the maximum on uh, the missions. If you can get between uh, a ridge between you and that radar site, they can't guide a missile at you. It's just when you get down in the delta in the flat lines, that 30 mile ring around uh, the city of Hanoi is, is a bear. I kind of call it the dry throat mission myself. Usually I come outbound from the target and I'm just kind of sucking that water bottle dry, dry throat. <laughs> Big thing that gets to us some nights. We're the only airplane going up, going up into the north. And when you think we're the only Americans over North Vietnam, it kind of makes you wonder just a little bit, you know. What am I doing here? American aircraft losses over the north increase each year. Anti-aircraft militia units, often women, become more effective. Hanoi claims 4,800 American planes downed over the north. The U.S. estimates 1,000. The relatively high rescue rate boosts pilot morale. About one in five shot down just inside the north are saved by special helicopter teams. Right, babe. Go get him. Okay, just stand by, babe. We're coming in to get you. Stand by. You're on a fence right here. Going to send him down. PJ's at the door. PJ-32 Elliott aircraft. Two Sikorskis constantly patrol the border. A V-shaped winch cuts through the jungle foliage then serves as a rescue platform. Fighter planes are called in to give protective fire. A second helicopter scouts for danger, ready for close-in fighting. The rescue helicopters become known as the Jolly Green Giants. More than 200 pilots are rescued from inside North Vietnam. Hold your hover, babe. Hold your hover. Looking good. Hold your hover. Hold your hover. The bear is coming up. It's about 10 foot off the ground. Hold your hover. Hold your hover. You're close to the tree. Hold your hover. It's right about 10 foot below the aircraft. 10 foot below the aircraft. Hold your hover, babe. Hold your hover. Hold your hover. Hold your hover. Hold your hover. Hold your survivors at the door. Survivors, send it secure. Let's get the hell out of here. Okay, talk to me. We're coming out. Go on, coming out. Let's go. Coming out. Okay, straight ahead. Straight ahead. Down that valley and get low. Get low. We love to follow that valley, Charlie. U.S. aircraft losses in both South and North Vietnam are put at 3,720. The dollar cost, 5 billion. And helicopter losses number 5,000. More than 8,000 American airmen are killed. About 800 of them in the north. 
Some personal possessions, such as helmets and identity tags, are collected for Hanoi's War Museum. Each pilot during the air war carries a message in several Asian languages saying, I am an American. I need your assistance. My government will repay you. More than 600 pilots are captured in the north. Most of the captives spend four or five years in prison, but for some, it lasts eight years. By 1968, the overall cost is too great for the man who oversees the air war. Defense Secretary Robert McNamara has lost confidence in America's ability to win the war. He is publicly viewed as a dispassionate architect of Vietnam's technological war, but privately, he agonizes. Once a proponent of the bombing, he now strongly advocates peace. President Johnson believes his defense secretary is cracking up. McNamara is eased out to head the World Bank. For many long and quite demanding years, Bob McNamara has guided the defense establishment. He has helped to give America the most efficient military strength in its history. And now, he's going to try, try to build the kind of world that alone can justify that strength. And now, in public, McNamara's torment shows. Mr. President, <coughs> I cannot <coughs> find words to uh, express what lies in my heart today. <coughs> and I think I'd better respond on another occasion. The B-52 becomes the test of air war technology in Vietnam. With a crew of six, the B-52 flies at 30 to 40,000 feet, close to the speed of sound. Its 100 bombs fall without warning in what is called whispering death. Its proponents regard the B-52 bomber as the single most effective weapon in the Vietnam air war. Its critics liken it to an unwieldy axe more likely to splinter trees than communist units. To be most effective, the B-52s must catch a North Vietnamese unit in the open. Then it is estimated one in three will be killed within the radius of the bomb blast. But in the jungle war, communist units are seldom without cover. A newspaper study indicates that in jungle areas, it takes three B-52s using 80 tons of bombs to kill one infiltrator. The cost is about $140,000. So the B-52 is viewed by its critics as a costly and inefficient method of fighting. As one critic put it, like using a sledgehammer to kill flies. And as the war goes on, the only solution is to deploy more and more B-52s over the infiltration trails. The B-52's effectiveness is also reduced by security problems. At times, the targets have to be approved by local officials, so communist agents may learn of impending raids. The Air Force must advise international airlines to keep away from bombing routes. Again, this may alert communist ground forces. Even though the bombing has stepped up, the infiltration of troops and supplies continues. Strategically, the air war fails. The helicopter is the spearhead of the American ground war in Vietnam. It is mobile firepower on an unprecedented scale. They fly at 150 miles per hour. M60 machine guns fire from both doors, saturating the terrain. Their rockets can hit targets half a mile away. Firepower is the capacity to inflict maximum casualties. Firepower and mobility shape the tactics of military commander General William Westmoreland. 
The most spectacular development was the coming of age of the helicopter. The helicopter saved innumerable lives uh, through uh, air evacuation. It gave us a battlefield mobility that uh, we never dreamed of even years previous. The biggest helicopters carry 10-ton artillery pieces to remote encampments called fire bases. An awesome use of firepower, a 15,000-pound bomb. The giant bomb is used to clear jungle areas for helicopter operations or for constructing fire bases. It is called the daisy cutter. The bomb explodes at treetop level, flattening a three-acre area. It enables helicopter landings. A field commander, General William Depew. The most that uh, we used during my time there uh, were about 90 uh, lift helicopters, supported by perhaps 30 or 40 uh, gunships. Uh, that, was an extra that was not an extravagant use, but that was a rich uh, mixture. That was enough to lift a battalion of infantry uh, with all of its support literally at one time and put it on the ground simultaneously. Uh, that meant within a matter of minutes you could bring another battalion into the battle at 90 miles an hour. There were many occasions where we were able to bring in in the course of a short battle, and most battles were short, uh, maybe an hour, an hour and a half, uh, usually at the longest. But within that very restricted amount of time, uh, we were able to bring in maybe two or three battalions. Helicopter technology enables large surprise operations against communist infiltrated areas. Major Joe Anderson. Two scout helicopters were flying around looking for our enemy and and as a result, the two helicopters were shot down. My platoon was in the air in uh, lift helicopters being taken to another location. When these two helicopters were shot down, we were moved to that location uh, on the spot, put on the ground to block the uh, departure of any enemy from the area. And then the rest of the cavalry division responded to that contact and, so to speak, piled on to the, uh, to the situation. We landed there early in the morning. We fought all that day. Uh, a total of seven companies were brought into the area. We surrounded the village and bombarded the village and fought all that night. And the next day, finally went through and uh, finished up the operation. Quite often, a scout platoon or scout helicopters would identify what looked to be like a likely North Vietnamese base camp. I can remember specifically on one occasion when a scout platoon had identified a large number of bunkers. The North Vietnamese are unaware they've been detected. They await reinforcements before launching their own operation. Whenever we had a good sighting of the North Vietnamese, helicopter lift ships would bring our U.S. forces into the closest landing zone possible. The U.S. commander plans to land troops by helicopter well to the east of the communists. His force will first make a diversionary move away from the camp, then suddenly swing back to the attack. An assault force of 500 soldiers is dropped in a clear area on a hilltop. They assemble, then set off on a detour of several days before swinging back. Once we were on the ground and, and moving in on the enemy, we were always careful of booby traps around their, their sites and particularly careful of snipers. Understanding the tendency of the North Vietnamese to, to avoid a major contact if they could, whenever possible, we would try to surround the enemy location. We always encountered 
them at their convenience. We never knew when the attack or the fight or the contact would begin. The American commander decides it is time to swing back and assault the main North Vietnamese position. Scouts observe the distant base camp without themselves being seen. The battle plan is to surround the communist base camp. One company will block to the south. Another will attack in the east and a third will block in the north. Another company will force march and attack from the northwest. The forces move in. A reconnaissance platoon engages the North Vietnamese scout party on the hill slope. The fighting begins. It began, it was always a surprise, and then there was always mass confusion trying to figure out what was the size of the force, where was the fire coming from, and how best to react to it. To assist us in trying to locate and identify the enemy, we would often bring in reconnaissance helicopters. The action area is located. An airstrike is called in. But the Vietnamese move in close to the Americans. Now further strikes could cause American casualties. So helicopter gunships are summoned for more precise firepower. Then, artillery support. Heavy guns open up from a fire base 10 miles away. The communist platoon is cut off from reinforcements. They must try to retreat. Once the artillery, helicopter gunships have done all that they can, it is up to we, the infantry units, to move in to finally locate and close with the enemy. American troops encircle and outnumber the North Vietnamese. They invite the North Vietnamese to surrender, but expect and get no response. Two infantry companies move up the slope, drawing the main fire. A third company attacks from the north. It sweeps through the communist camp. But in the drawn-out action, the majority of North Vietnamese manage to slip away. A typical operation lasting several days yields a few dead and their weapons. Having cleared such areas, the Americans then withdraw. The communists soon reappear. Firepower does not decide the war, but it does win battles. Well, in discussing the use of firepower, being on the recipient of that, I was quite pleased. And uh, I can remember in instances where we would be engaged with the enemy and uh, there would be artillery coming in, there would be helicopters, there would be air force support and naval gunfire. And again, looking for all the help that I could get, there was never too much firepower. For Americans on forward patrol, communist firepower also decimates without warning. Soldier Tim O'Brien. I remember a day when we were encamped in a large clearing and an explosion went off maybe 200 yards away. We had a patrol out. And I made the call out to the patrol from the radio and no answer. And the captain was kind of joking, saying, you know, it's just probably a stray artillery round. A half an hour later, the, one of the survivors, of, it was a mine, booby trap brother, hobbled back and said, they're gone. They're, they're all gone. And we actually, we raced out and there were maybe, I guess, two men still living out of a patrol of eight or so. Uh, just a mess. That's, that's, what, that's what a huge mine will do, or a huge booby trap will do. More than 47,000 Americans die in combat in Vietnam. South Vietnamese troop losses exceed a quarter of a million. Communist losses are estimated at over one million. In a nuclear age, the weaponry used in Vietnam is totally conventional. The American M16 rifle. In Vietnam, the M16 is frequently criticized as less reliable than the communist equivalent. The M60 is the standard machine gun for the U.S. Army. It is air-cooled and accurate, firing up to 550 rounds a minute. 
The M79 grenade launcher is introduced in Vietnam. It fires a variety of grenades, beyond normal range, up to 400 yards. America's standard medium motor, 81 millimeter, range up to three miles. The 105 howitzer. In Vietnam, it is widely used for a new tactic, the fire support base. With fire base artillery support, combat troops operate 10 miles deep in the hostile countryside. Most fire bases are close to the border infiltration routes, so the hilltop bases draw some of the fiercest fighting. Over 8 million tons of munitions are used in the ground war. Naval firepower is turned inland. The U.S. 7th Fleet, unchallenged at sea, has a unique role in Vietnam. It provides heavy support for operations along the east coast. The Navy ships with their 8 and 16 inch guns are able to fire up to 23 miles inland. They serve as mobile fire bases for the land war. The North Vietnamese have no ships capable of effective counterattack. Communist shore guns lack the range to retaliate. But North Vietnam's militia and army is equipped with the best Soviet and Chinese weapons. In ground combat, communist weapons come to match American firepower. The Soviet AK-47 rifle, the standard weapon of the North Vietnamese soldier, it is at least as accurate as the American M16 and is said to be more reliable. The B-40 mobile rocket launcher. This communist weapon is the one most feared in Vietnam. Its warhead can penetrate 12 inches of armor plate. The American infantry has no counterpart to the lethal B-40. Vietnam's terrain defeats some American technology. Tank warfare has little success. The U.S. Marines field a tank called Antos. It has six recoilless rifles, but it is also cumbersome in Vietnam. The most effective armored vehicle is the Amtrak, a troop carrier. It transports Marines from ships offshore through waterways, then inland to their objective. The North Vietnamese get Soviet T-55 tanks to match the American buildup. They also receive the Soviet 130 millimeter field gun. It fires a 73 pound shell a distance of almost 20 miles. But simple arms prove the most destructive. Handmade guerrilla pistols, crude mortars built from tubes, landmines and booby traps. Small arms cause over half the American deaths in Vietnam, compared with one third in World War II and Korea. In the early days of the war, communist guerrillas obtain American weapons by raiding remote government outposts. Guerrilla ordnance experts ingeniously create new weapons from found or captured U.S. models. Having studied the construction of American weaponry, they can remove the delicate explosive fuse from a bomb. Then the internal timing and guidance systems are taken out. The projectile is now safe to handle and is broken apart. The steel casing is cut and the plastic explosive dislodged. The 
the metal is cut into steel rings at a primitive workshop. These become the outer shells of powerful road mines. Tiny pellets of steel are carefully arranged in the casings to add to the explosive impact of the mines. Wax holds the explosives in place. The finished product is stored in a makeshift armaments factory. A detonator is tested, then the device is buried in a roadway used by American patrols. At least one in ten American casualties result this way. Soldier Tim O'Brien. The most feared mine was the Bouncing Betty. Um, it's a mine that's, that's conical shaped and has three prongs jutting out of the soil. When your foot hits the prongs, the mine physically, there's a charge goes off that shoots the mine up into the air, say a yard, two feet high, and explodes, spraying uh, shrapnel everywhere. It's a mine that goes after, the, obviously, the lower legs, the testicles, um, maybe the lower torso. Uh, a, a terrible mine. Other mines were what we called toe poppers. They were little bitty things, would blow a heel off or a part of a foot, maybe a whole foot. Uh, I saw men hobbling after hitting a mine like that uh, with their foot gone. And of course, there are variants in all these, these kinds. Grenades were often turned into mines by placing a hand grenade into a tin can, pulling the, the, the pin out, and the tin can st stops what they call the spoon from releasing which would set the mine off. Then, a, then, a, then a, a string is attached to the grenade. When you walk across, down a path, you hit the string, which pulls the grenade out of the tin can, releasing the spoon, and the grenade goes off. It's a clever little device. In Vietnam, point duty, leading the patrol, is the most hazardous job. The U.S. even tries using German shepherd dogs to smell out mines. U.S. forces use mild weapons like tear gas to flush out tunnels and awesome weapons unseen before. Napalm. This petroleum explosive is extensively used. It is sometimes criticized as an inhumane weapon. An anti-personnel bomb it showers hundreds of metal pellets. These devices are developed for use in Vietnam. North Vietnam claims they cause heavy civilian casualties. This film was taken by a Japanese investigating commission. One tiny bomb contains thousands of pellets able to penetrate walls. Many of the anti-personnel bombs fail to go off. They are converted to booby traps for use against the Americans. One crude device is fashioned by tying steel rods around a stick of dynamite with a remote detonator. Primitive or sophisticated, the firepower objective of both sides is war from a distance. The war spurs ever more sophisticated technology, including laser-guided bombs that automatically home in on the target. A laser kit on the warhead picks up the reflection from the target. Movable tail fins automatically steer the bomb. A weapons expert, General William Depew. As you undoubtedly uh, remember the oft-repeated story of the famous Tanwa Bridge. Uh, I don't know how many sorties and how many tons of bombs were dropped in an attempt to break, uh, to, to drop that span, uh, but a laser-guided uh, bomb did it apparently on the first try. War always uh, engenders uh, a great expenditure of money on high technology, and the precision-guided munitions, although they saw uh, their early use during the Vietnam War, their real significance remains for the future.
new weapons and dependence on sheer firepower exact a huge cost in Vietnam in many ways. The U.S. spends $110 billion above normal defense costs. Artillery fire. One operation on just one day may require 10,000 rounds. Each shell costs about $40. In all, a cost of half a million dollars a day in a single battle. Coordinating firepower is often difficult, and the cost then is the counterproductive delay. The artillery, for instance, may be waiting while fighter jets complete their mission. Or the jets may wait while Navy guns fire. By 1968, $10 billion worth of supplies and equipment are being used in Vietnam without being paid for. It is a fight now, pay later policy. Part of this money is siphoned from NATO defense. Critics say this jeopardizes the Western alliance. After America withdraws, it does not maintain the modern army it has given South Vietnam. Eventually, the communists capture $5 billion worth of American military equipment. To the end, weaponry and manpower escalate in continued cycles. General Depew. One thing that characterized each one of these cycles is it went to a higher plane. In other words, each time the peak was higher than the time before, meaning more troops were involved. And I think many people don't understand that the last peak, there were 22 North Vietnamese divisions involved. That's larger, by the way, than the current United States Army. So those who think that it was a, a sophisticated, subtle guerrilla war fought for the hearts and minds of people in the villages and hamlets were only partly right. It was all of that. But it was at the same time a very large, vicious, tough war. <laughs> 